Hey, somebody's going to take the turkey out of the freezer. You did? Excellent. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. You are listening to the Professional Noticer. Here you and I will use common sense and all the wisdom we can muster to move beyond what is true and go all the way to the truth. With actual listeners in more than 100 countries, I am the Professional Noticer. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Andrews. Hey, thank you for making me a part of your week. My purpose here today and with every show we do is to play the part of a best friend or a coach. I want to help you live the life of your wildest dreams by giving you access to some of the greatest mentors the world has to offer today. Our sponsor this week is GrowingDeer.com. If you already watch Growing Deer episodes or regularly visit the GrowingDeer.com website, you know why the professional noticer is a fan. You know, our boys are fascinated by every episode, but they love all things outdoors. On the other hand, there is my wife, Polly. She loves the show too, and she loves all things indoors. (laughs) How could that be? Probably because GrowingDeer.com is about so much more than just deer. Uh, Wildlife biologist Dr. Grant Woods is the host of every week's program, and the subjects, uh, honestly, all the time, range from scientific tips to common sense wisdom. Dr. Grant's wife, Tracy, as well as their daughters, Raleigh and Ray, make frequent appearances, and the whole operation is, is an awesome example of how family can work together and play together and support each other outdoors. Uh, You know, recipes are sometimes included as well as a lot on obtaining and preparing the food for the recipe. How about that? And so whether you're an outdoor person or not, certainly you know an outdoor person, so turn them on to growingdeer.com and you go check it out too. By the way, I love how Dr. Grant ends each episode by saying, go outdoors and enjoy creation this week. Take some time to reflect and listen to what the Creator is saying to you. That's GrowingDeer.com. Observations and answers, that's what we do here on The Professional Noticer. And, you know, we have managed to bring some awesome people to me. But I, I, I think my guest today, I am more excited about, I, and I think because, not only because of his past, but because of his present and the future that his present promises. I, I'm very excited about this. For, you know, for 17 years, many of you have watched this guy's work, and you, you might recognize his name. Our guest was a, he was an Emmy Award-winning producer and senior manager at the Worldwide Leader in Sports, ESPN. And he has produced all the shows. He's worked with all the shows that you like. You know, he's produced uh, Sports Center and Monday Night Football and Mike and Mike in the Morning and Sunday NFL Countdown, College Game Day, the Major League Baseball All Star Game. I just like I am just amazed. And so, if anybody has a right to create a book called The Uniform of Leadership. Lessons from my true lessons on true success from my ESPN life. It is Jason Romano, our guest today. Jason, thank you for being here. Andy, thank you for that introduction. So good to see you. So good to talk to you, buddy. Thanks for being. Thanks for inviting me to be here. Well, you know, we were talking last week, and and then you mentioned you had a, a fairly new book out, and I was like, really? I well, <laughs> you know, I don't have it, and I want to get it. I read it this weekend. And I got, I got to tell you, I got it Friday, and I read it this weekend, and I've read, a, as you might imagine, a ton of leadership books. And I actually just did something the other day on a script about how leadership books kind of drive me crazy because they're all mm. very derivative. They're all the same thing. And yeah. that is just a, a lesson to me The set. As soon as I say that, the first leadership book I read afterward, I go, this is new. This is different. And, and so I, I am so excited about this book. And, and, and I've got a ton of questions about it. Sure. But, but first of all, can I just put something to bed? Just, I just need to tell you. <laughs> yes. Okay. Here's what it is. My sports world came kind of crashing down when you 
retired from ESPN. Uh, it was kind of a double-edged whammy. It's like a front hand and a back hand. See, I have known who you were forever because I used to listen to Mike and Mike in the mornings uh. at ESPN, and they would talk about you, and I would hear about And so I, I Googled Jason Romano, and I, you know, I've known who you were forever. And then I'm listening one day, and you're leaving. And I'm like, okay, that's it. Because it was the first year that Peyton Manning did not play, and then you retired as a double whammy, and it, it just kind of did it for me with sports. Mm. I just, I, I, you know. I'm sorry just, to, to, to bring you to tears there, Andy. I mean, gosh, <laughs> were you able to move on and move forward? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It took a while. It took a while, but I, I have been. Some, some of my friends are like, where have you been? I said, my God, based, Peyton Manning and Jason Romano at once. And they said, yeah, we get it. We get it. So, That's so funny. the book has just recently come out, and yeah. I and explain the concept, if you will, the uniform of, of leadership. I didn't know what that meant when I saw the title, but now I'm I'm into it. So the idea, Andy, was I mean, first of all, I never wanted to write any books. Let's put it that way. Uh, that's not my. I don't. I didn't always think that was ever a calling on my life. I was always a producer, a content creator, a sports guy. Uh, and a couple of years before this book came out, my first uh, an opportunity to write my first book happened, which is a completely different subject on forgiveness and my uh, relationship with my dad. And so I write that book and I get calls that they're happy and they're encouraged by the book. And then uh, my co-author, Steve Copeland, and I, he comes to me and he's like, so are we going to do a second one? And I'm like, I don't that's it's hard to write a book you know this you yeah i know i just like dozens oh. of books it's not easy i know and you put a book out and somebody reads it and they say when's your next week coming out and you're like give me a break give can't we just break. like let this thing marinate yeah. for a little bit here <laughs> and we want another book um it's funny I, I wasn't planning on writing this second book but when the opportunity came a publisher came along and they you know we you, you know how this book world works i mean you send out like you know uh what they call them, book proposals, I guess. And you kind of write out what may become a book and then you shop it around and agent kind of shops it around. And the idea was initially to write a book about my time at ESPN and just share some of the stories. You know, I was a talent booker and a producer for many years. So I got to hang out and spend time with some of the biggest names in sports. And I thought, you know what, this is the stories that I'm always asked to tell. Well, let's tell them in a book sure. form. Sure. But as we got putting it together, I realized, listen, you know, it's nice to be entertained and people can read a book and be encouraged or whatever, but I really wanted something that could be applicable to someone's life. And I've been devouring leadership books the last five, six years. So leadership has been something that I've been really passionate about. You know, people like Maxwell, people like John Gordon, Simon Sinek, just some incredible writers and, and, and really smart people on this topic of leadership. I love, love John Gordon, by the way, and he wrote the, the forward for this. He did, yeah, and I was so thankful to John. But when I thought about putting this book together, you know, Steve Copeland and I, my co-author, we said, well, what if, or I said to him, what if we took these stories, we told the stories, but we had lessons that were from these stories that we could implement into our own lives, like leadership lessons, and that's where the initial birth of what this book became started from. But the idea of the uniform and being this sports metaphor of each and every one of us waking up every single day and having to put on a uniform that we don't even realize we're putting on. So that's what the uniform of leadership is, waking up every day, putting on a uniform, and we have to make a decision on who we're going to play for that day. Because when you wear a uniform in sports, Andy, you have to make a decision as an athlete. Are you going to play for the name on the front of the jersey, which is the team usually, or the name on the back of the jersey, which is the athlete, the last name usually of the athlete? Well, that's how, we, how it is in life, I think, when we think about decisions and, and being intentional about how we're going to live our lives. Are we going to live it for ourselves first, or are we going to live it for others first? And the uniform of leadership, wearing it properly, wearing the uniform of leadership properly is playing for the other team per, first, playing for others, first, serving others, loving others first, before we get so consumed with our own world. And as you put it so well in the in the book, you, you talk about what, what it's like, and it's a chapter about humility, and you talk about putting your uniform on backwards so that your yeah. name is in the front, you know, and what a disaster that has been over and over again. You know, there's a curious thing 
uh, Zig Ziglar was a friend of mine, and yeah. Zig told me one time, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I, I just, I have always loved this, just this thought. He said um, that years ago, he said the there was some unbelievable percentage of players in the NFL that were that had played at Alabama, Notre Dame, and Penn State. And he said, sure. and do you know what all those teams have in common? None of them had their names on their jerseys. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, think of, here's another team, the New York Yankees intentionally leave the names off the back of their jerseys and only put on the NY or the, the Yankees on the front of the jersey and New York or whatever it is, and that's who they play for. I, I didn't even think about that. I didn't include that in the book because the majority of sports teams, as you know, have right. the names on the back of the jersey, have the team name, especially in a baseball or a basketball world, team name on the front of the jersey, and that's what we have to think about. But that's a great point, and when you think about the successful programs – Thinking about the Yankees right now, I mean, you can right. love them or you can hate them, but you can't, you know, take away the success that they've had. That's a great point. Yeah, that was that was a Bear Bryant thing, you know. I mean, I, I yeah. grew up in Alabama, and so you know, been very aware of that. Talk about. Uh, I, I loved the part in the book. I, this really just this spoke to me for young people, especially, but being great where you are. You know about growing where you're planted. Yes. And you had you had a conversation. I I think that that chapter revolves around Tony Dungy and and him coming in. And you were in charge for for those of our listeners and viewers who who don't know, because you were such senior level, you were actually the one who would take people to what they call the ESPN car wash which was like you'd take them from this show to that show to this show. And you'd spend the entire day with these people. That's right. Yeah. And it's interesting when I think about, uh, you know, growing where you're planted, blooming where you're planted. It's a, it's a, it's something that it sounds great, but it's really hard to implement in our lives because we're so trained and focused on the next thing. We just talked about the book, right? You write a book. They want to know when the next book's coming out. And you're like, can we, can we just grow this thing first? Right. And I think in our careers, in our lives, we're constantly thinking where about where we're going and we forget about where we are. And that happened to me. That happened at ESPN as I'm trying to become this producer level, um, you know, employee who can work on some of these big shows and I'm working my way up. And I'm training to be a, you know, a producer and I forget about the job that I am actually being paid to do each day, which at that time was called talent producer, which was a booker in essence. And the team that was around me was relying on me and depending on me to be great in the job that I had right there. That would allow them to be great and we would work as a cohesive unit. But I was so focused on trying to chase the corporate ladder, climb the corporate ladder, the next job, the next moment, the next opportunity that I failed miserably and I forgot to bloom where I was right at that moment. And it's funny because when I met Coach Dungy and his assistant Jessica was with him as well and Coach and, and Jessica, I'm walking them around, I'm taking them to shows and Coach Dungy asked me a question that changes my life forever. I tell people this. He simply asked, Jason, how do you live your faith out? I'm a man of faith. Coach Dungy's a man of faith. We found this out pretty quickly. And he asked me, he said, how do you live out your faith here at ESPN? And I have been thinking a lot about, you know, maybe what is the next calling on my life from God? Where am I going next? And Coach Dungy asked me this question and I answer with, I don't know if I can live my faith out here at ESPN, Coach. I said, I probably have to leave and go somewhere else if I'm to do that. Well, Jessica steps right in front, and I could tell Coach didn't like my answer. I could tell Jessica didn't like my answer, but Jessica <laughs> was the one that jumped in, and she goes, Jason, don't you get it? Look where you are. You can be a, a light for other people right here, right now at ESPN, and maybe God will call you away. Maybe you'll end up somewhere else. Maybe you'll go to a different place and work someday, which, spoiler alert, did happen, but until that happens, you are to bloom where you're planted, and that word, those words, that line, that phrase, whatever you want to call it. And we've heard it in other spheres too. But for Jessica to say that to me, 
and Tony to ask that question, Coach Dungey to ask that question, change my perspective, Andy, on how I'm going to go about the rest of my life living in the moment. And yes, it's important to have dreams and goals and aspirations and, and head in a direction that you think God is calling you to go to. But don't forget where you are. And for a lot of people, where they are isn't the best place or they don't think it's the best place. But there's a purpose behind every person in, in the exact place that God has placed them in right now. And it's to bloom. It's to really make, uh, you know, take advantage, I guess, or not lose sight of the moment and where we are and to help others and to serve others. And that's the best way to go about it. And Jessica that day shows me how to bloom where I'm planted and it changes my life forever. I, I wrote down a sentence that you had in that story. And I, I read your book, by the way, I, your, your book to me, I read it like I tend to read all books that have a, an impact on my life. I get to about the middle of the second chapter, and then I stop and go find a highlighter so that I can start over. And, and I've I, I, there, I probably more that's not highlighted in this book. But you had this, uh, this sentence that I thought was very interesting about that. You said, constantly reaching for more breeds fear and anxiety in our present circumstances that leads to micromanaging what we want our future to be. Mm. I just, so I thought that was really good. That and and it's not that we should not reach for more, but you but it's that word constantly. Constantly reaching for more. Cuz if you're constantly reaching for more, you're right, you're not doing the job you're hired to do. You're not blooming where you're planted. You're not making a difference there. And it's obvious to me that um that you you resolved that at that time with I think Jessica and coach Dungey really uh did good work with you because years later I, I was watching, not listening, but watching the day that you retired. And I had never seen the cameras on anybody but Mike and Mike or their guest. And and so I mean they but they took a lot of time to talk about you and the difference you had made in their lives and in ESPN. And I, I just I, you know, I got I had a great feeling about them that day, and I had a lot of confirmation about about you. But it was obvious now that I know the story behind that that mm. you did become hugely influential. You know, other than just the sports stuff in that. Well, what's interesting too, Andy, is I wasn't looking to do that. You know, I wasn't being intentional to be influential. Like I wasn't chasing after. Right. The highest stature platform. I mean, that's, I still am not trying to chase that, honestly. I'm just trying to be obedient and, you know, as and honoring God, I guess, in the best way I can with the, with right. whatever he gives me or the opportunities that he gives me. And it's funny that last day at ESPN, you use the word retire, by the way. I, I never thought about that word. I don't think I've ever used that word when I've told the story. I just yeah, say, you're, yeah, you're too young. I to left retire. ESPN. No, I, but you're right. I mean, I, it's what we use in the sports world, right? When a person retires and they're 35 years old and yet they're moving on just to the next chapter of life and the next opportunity. So retiring I guess you're right. In essence, it was retiring from that chapter because it was 17 years. And by the way, when Mike and Mike took and by, I just want you to know this, it was about three minutes of airtime. So it, 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 in some people listening might think or watching, well, that's not that long in television and radio. Shoot. Three minutes is it a is. very long that time. Is I mean, a people long. pay a lot. People pay a lot of money <laughs> to get three minutes of airtime on a show. And I never asked for that. I didn't even know it was coming. I knew it was my last day and they all knew, obviously the crew. Um, but I wasn't, it was, you know, you get to like 945 Eastern and the show's just about over and you're like, all right, I got 10 minutes left and then we're done here and I'm done forever here potentially. And all of a sudden, Greeny says, turn that camera over to the other side and point that camera at Jason Romano. And then they give like this two minute, you know, goodbye in essence and thank you for all the work I've done. And that caught me completely off guard. But it was the nicest thing that could have ever happened. It was the perfect close to this long chapter of 17 years and working at ESPN. Uh, and I guess it opened my eyes to show me, like you said, Andy, that maybe I did have an impact on people in my time working there, because when you're in the middle of it, you know this, it, you're just kind of going through it a lot of times and you don't realize the impact. It's not like every, 
every little small step that you take, somebody stops you and says, you're amazing, great job, you're awesome. Right. Um, it usually comes in bigger moments like somebody leaving after a long time or unfortunately in some cases like at a funeral or you know, a celebration in that regard. And it felt a little bit like a funeral, but a, <laughs> but a happy funeral where it was like, okay, this is great. I appreciate all that uh, you guys had to say about me. So, Well, I, and th- they seemed... You know, I've never met either one of those guys, but I, I was I listened to them a lot, and sure. so I heard your name a lot. And and I they, just tell me they're nice guys. Just tell they me. are. They yeah, are. I would. Good. I would. I will talk about Greeny and Golick all day long. I mean, Greeny and Golick are amazing guys. First of all, they're extremely talented at what they do. They wouldn't have done it for as long as they did. They're in the Radio Hall of Fame. I mean, they're people that you can watch and learn from. And anything that I've ever been able to do from a post ESPN career, as far as on air work, you know, I give a lot of credit to people like Greeny and Golick, uh, people like Bob Lee, who I worked with, who was an right. outside the lines host. Those guys are legends, Chris Berman. And it's an, oppor- it's an opportunity for me to say thank you to those guys, even on a, on a platform like this, to say thank you for your influence on me, no matter how big or small it was. And uh, yes, Greeny and Golick, though, very nice guys, great family guys, and just incredibly uh, talented at what they do. You know, I, I care. I, I, mean, I hate to say this because somebody's going to, I'll get a letter about this or an email <laughs> or something, but I care nothing about the Jets. But I, to this day, I notice whether they win or lose just because, ah, oh, Greeny's happy. Ah, oh, Greeny's sad. I, you yeah. know, because they talked about it so much. You know, there is a picture in the book of you with Golick and Mike Greenberg and Chris Berman. And yet one of the best stories in the book is uh, about Tammy. Tell us about Tammy and about her last day and that just the banner and Scott Van Pelt. I, yeah. I was blown away by that. Well, Andy, I got to tell you, putting the book together, it's easy to just highlight all the famous people that you've heard of and seen. But when Steve and I, my co-author, were were putting this idea together, I said, I want to tell you about somebody named Tammy before we start writing about her and see if you think that this is worth putting in the book. And as I told the story of Tammy, he said, oh, we have to put this in the book. And in fact, we need more Tammies in this book because everybody can relate to somebody like Tammy. Not everybody can relate to an Andy, you know, to a, a Drew Brees or a Tony Dungy or Chris Berman or Mike and Mike, other than watching them on TV, but maybe having not met them. But everybody has worked with a Tammy. Now, a Tammy, in this case, Tammy McBriarty, is this amazing woman who worked for just about as long as I did, 17, 18 years at ESPN. And every day she would come in and she worked in our cafeteria and she was the one who was at the, you know, at the cash register when you checked out from going to buy your food for the, for lunch or breakfast or dinner. And there's Tammy at the cash register smiling, just looking at you and saying hello, but not only saying hello, she would say, hello, Jason, how are you? How's your day going? And she, she did that to about 3000 employees every single day, Andy, and knew their names. Yeah, and how Tammy Sa- was how's Sarah? An incredible person. How's Sarah doing? She would ask me about my daughter. How's your family doing? How's your wife doing? She did this not just with me, but with it felt like every single person who walked through those halls at ESPN and worked there every day. And so Tammy comes to the end of her her time. And by the way, Tammy's one of the great leaders you'll ever meet. And right. she's not this powerful, influential vice president, senior VP of this or that. She's not any of that. She's just somebody who comes and does her job every single day and does it very, very well. And on her last day, most people, when they leave ESPN, they get like a banner. ESPN has these banners and they have a bunch of people sign the banner, kind of like a yearbook. Sure. Remember when we were kids in high school in the yearbook, you would sign your yearbook on the last day and wish someone luck. Well, that's what they did with Tammy, and they had this banner signed. And you can search it. You can Google it on Twitter or on the Internet and find a picture of this banner, and there is no space available. In fact, people are writing so small just to be able to put this little notation to Tammy and wish her nothing but the best and tell her how influential she was on their lives. And Scott Van Pelt even profiled her on his show that night on SportsCenter because That's how much Tammy meant to so many, but that's the impact and the influence that she had on so many people's lives. And she's, like I said, one of the best leaders, if not the best leader I ever saw at ESPN. 
and she had no specific title or status. She just was great blooming, like you say, where she was planted. She was awesome. Yeah, I I remember seeing because it was like the the one big thing, right? Yes. That Scott yeah. did, and uh, I remember seeing that too, and just being blown away. I mean, here's this guy with this powerful position that, you know, the one big thing on Sports Center for the day, you know, right? And it's yeah. the the lady in in the cafeteria, and I and I I wish I I wish I could. And maybe you can, but do you remember how he ended that piece? Because it was something that just blew me away. I don't. I wish I did off it, the top of was, my head. I, it was something I had to go like, watch, and watch it. Yeah, it was something like we're, you know, I, I'm talking about her uh, not because, you know, we're a big deal uh, or, you know, I'm talking about her because, not because you know our names, but because she knew our names and right. so it's like that story Incredible. that you said yeah yeah i mean tammy i'm not exaggerating when i tell you she and you can ask any person who ever worked in bristol connecticut at espn for the last 15 years you know and there was three thousand four thousand employees there you ask any of them and tammy would know their at least know their first name probably know their last name may know their husband or wife's name and probably knows their kid's name like that's tammy and that was wow. how awesome she was please tell me you got her a book I did. In fact, Good. that was the cool thing. I hadn't talked to Tammy in a couple of years. I had to get her permission. Obviously, I didn't want to write about her without you know, her knowing about it. So I said, hey, I'm going to write a little bit about you in this book. This was probably a couple of years ago. She gave me permission, said no problem. We still didn't use her last name in the book, uh, but it's McBriarty. It's out there. And then when the book came out in July, and we're in a pandemic, obviously, so we had to be careful. But I said, hey, can can I get you a free copy of my book? I would love to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. She came over to the house. We sat out on the porch, social distance. I gave her a copy and then we masked it out. I took the mask off for just a minute and took a picture together, which I shared on my Instagram because it was a neat thing to be able to hand to her the book and say, you are a chapter in this book. This is how influential you were on me and for so many. And, uh, that was really neat. And it was great to connect with her, reconnect with her. She's a cancer survivor, Andy. So she's a fighter and, uh, and she's doing really well. So it was really nice to see her. That is awesome. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you like two more questions before we go, but I, I just want to take just a moment and, and we're going to have uh, all the, how to reach you and everything on the show notes, uh, and, and a link to the book. Um, but I just I just want to say to to those of you who would like to get some leadership stuff in the hands of your young adult, this is the book. I'm telling you, this is the book. And and for those of you who like to put leadership books through your business, okay, um, it, this this is this is the one to do. And. And I, I, I feel pretty qualified to say that. Uh, Jason, Jim Trestle said to me one time, um, they, he used the, the traveler's gift one year at, at Ohio State. And he told me, he said, he said well, you know, the, the players, he said, they, they probably like this book better than any we've ever done. And so I said, thank you. But I didn't say, well, coach. It's because it was just it's a bunch of stories. It's in you know it's kind of interesting and yeah. and and so to me for those of you who you know because we hear people all the time say well I don't like to read and I'm like seriously you're just telling you're telling me you've never read an email that made you laugh out loud you never read something that you sent to everybody on your list you never read some something that made you tear up and. And of course you have, but you think you don't like to read because you read a couple of books that were boring. Okay, well, find somebody that doesn't bore you to tears. You know, I tell people it doesn't have to be my books, but you That's know, right. yeah. statistics say you need to read somebody's books. And and this one, the uniform of leadership for for a, a young person, for a team, uh, for a, a group of business people. Man, you talk about and, and the discussion questions at the end of each chapter. I thought were fabulous. So, mm. anyway, here's here's a uh, second to the last question I have for you. Okay, and I'll I'll prep this by saying 
I, I told my wife not too long ago, I said, one of the things that I really like about my life is that I have these books to give to people on airplanes, you know, and, you know, I've, uh, you know, when somebody needs something, I, you know, I, 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 my next door neighbor just like adores Amy Grant. And so, you know, last time I was with Amy, I said, Amy, here, hold this. And I, I wrote, hi, Brian, on it. And Amy just held it up and I took a picture for Brian. And of course, he <laughs> framed it. You know, he's got it in, in his house. But when I read the story in the book about you as a, as a young man there at ESPN and a guy who's very senior, very uh, well-respected, I've always loved him too, and what Trey Wingo did for you, using his influence just for nothing but to make you happy, just because he could. Just be- Would you tell that story? I would. I'm so glad you're asking that because there's a lot of stories in the book, but that one is probably personally my favorite because, you know, I didn't realize the impact in, in its – at its time on the, and, yeah, and the it just felt like a nice tra- thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, when you look back and you know, I have proof of that every day and I'll explain that in a minute that I can look at and say, man, that was such an amazing gesture by Trey. So full disclosure here. I hope your audience isn't mad when they hear this, Andy, but I am a Dallas Cowboys fan. Uh, I've been a big <laughs> Cowboys fan. I say suffering Dallas Cowboys fan now because they haven't won anything in 25 plus years, but I have been a Cowboys fan since I was six years old. Um, I I rebelled against my father. He's a Giants fan. I love the star on the helmet. I loved Roger Staubach as a little bitty boy and then loved Danny White and Tony Dorsett as I started growing up into my, you know, in that 10 to 12 range and that influential age and stuck with them. I stuck with them through the 90s when they won a ton, the tough years of the 2000s and certainly into now. And Emmett Smith you know, came into the league, I think when I was 16 or 17 in high school, he retired when I was in my thirties and married and, um, you know, watching his career was one of my favorite joys. You know, I really loved the way he played. He never missed games. He was consistent. He was never the very best in terms of when you watched him, you weren't like, Oh my gosh, this guy is absolutely amazing. He was just rock solid, consistent, in the way that he went about his business every single week in every single game. And so I, I took a liking to him. I had his jersey. I had posters of him when I was in high school and college and just loved Emmett Smith. So I find out in 2007, Trey Wingo comes to me one day. And at that time, I was working on outside the lines. Trey Wingo was working on uh, NFL Live. and But we all kind of knew each other in this little production world. So Trey knows I'm a Cowboys fan. And he says, Jason. Emmett's coming to ESPN today. Do you want to meet him? And he didn't even say Emmett Smith. He just said Emmett. And I'm like, Emmett who? <laughs> he goes, no, Emmett Smith, dummy. I said, okay. So uh, I'm like, yes, I absolutely would like to meet him. He said, all right, meet me in the newsroom at 2.30 and, uh, and just follow my lead. I said, all right, here we go. So I, <laughs> it's so funny, Andy, between when Trey emailed me and that actual 2.30 meeting was probably about an hour. And I don't know if I was alive for that hour because I don't remember being able to breathe. I was very excited, <laughs> hyperventilating a little bit. I called my wife and I told her I'm about to meet Emmett Smith. So if I don't make it, you know, make sure everybody's taken care of. Like I was genuinely that excited. And, uh, and I got to tell you, Trey, when I got there, there's Emmett in his suit. He was, it, he was at ESPN kind of auditioning for a job that he would get another year later as an analyst. And, uh, and he was going to be on... NFL Live. So Trey had me meet him in the in the uh, newsroom, and and Trey's walking to the NFL Live studio, and I'm just kind of hanging out in the back with another producer walking. He doesn't say anything to me yet. He just says, "Follow me. Just you know, keep coming." We get into the studio, and at this point, it's just me and Trey Wingo and Emmett Smith, and we walk into the studio, Studio F. I'll never forget Studio E. And uh, Trey looks at me, goes, "No, come here." I said, all right, because I'm still a little hesitant. So we get into the studio and Trey says, Emmett, this is Jason Romano. He's one of our producers here. Just want you to meet him. Guys, I got to go run and, and take care of something, makeup or something. I'll be right back. 
Trey did that on purpose, I found out. He didn't need huh. to do anything, but he left three minutes, basically, three to four minutes for me and my football hero to spend a few minutes together. Wow. Now, I've, I've met a lot of my heroes in the past, and I'm very thankful for those opportunities at ESPN, but this one was one of the first times I'd really met somebody that was on the top five list of Jason's guys when it came to sports, right. and, and it might have been one or two behind Daryl Strawberry. It was those guys, right? And I happen to have, you'll laugh at this, at the time, iPhones weren't around yet. People weren't taking pictures on their phones just yet. So I had a digital camera that I happened to have with me. I say happened to have, but I did right, happen right. to have it that day. And I said to Trey, would you be willing to take a picture? And Emmett was very gracious. We took a picture together. Four years later, he came back to ESP and he signed that picture for me. It's sitting in the man cave downstairs. And it's a reminder <laughs> every day of the unbelievably awesome gesture and the unselfishness of Trey Wingo to say, I don't need to do this, but I want to do this because I know Jason, this will mean so much to him to just spend two minutes with his, one of, with one of his guys. And Emmett was gracious. He was so nice to me that day. And what an amazing display of leadership that Trey put on that day without even realizing it about putting others first. And, uh, it was such an amazing, amazing moment for me. You know, it's amazing to me that to this day, you look at this picture of you and Emmett, a hero to you, and you think about Trey Wingo. Yeah, I don't even think about Emmett. And I love Emmett, obviously, and I have his jerseys and things like that. But I look at that picture and I see Trey Wingo every time because, and I told Trey this, probably like seven or eight years later, I told him how much that day meant to me. He didn't even remember it. That's the silly, that's the funny part about this. And I think that's actually a really good thing because he was just doing something because that's who Trey is and being nice and just caring about his teammates. And he would have done that for hopefully any other staff member if he knew that they were an Emmett Smith fan too. He didn't even remember it. I had to remind him. And he's like, I do remember now because I remember when Emmett came and uh, I showed him the picture. I said, you took this picture, Trey. And now it's sitting, you know, it's a picture is in my book and it's sitting down in the man cave and it's, uh, yeah. It was just so cool. I think it's awesome, and <clears throat> I think it's important to know, you know, not not all of us are in a position that Trey Wing goes in, but all of us are in a position to do something for somebody that otherwise would not be done, right? right. I mean, we are yes. in a position to do something or introduce somebody or say something to somebody that otherwise would <clears throat> would never be accomplished. Um, Absolutely. I have one more question for you. I, I, you know, I started to say I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I planned to ask you the question, and I knew that uh, put me you, on the you spot, didn't have Andy. an answer, so I'm putting you on the spot. Um, <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, I am. I I know you well enough to know that you you're a you're a thinker, you're a noticer, you you are a you, you figure you you. You pray, you, and so I, I know you well enough to know that you are having epiphanies. You're having ideas. There, there are things that <clears throat> you know now that you didn't know a year ago, uh, life-changing things. And so if you could look at the past six months of your life, can you name, just name something that, that you figured out or that you've learned or that you're excited about knowing that you feel like, gosh, I, you know, I kind of want to get in a conversation about this. What, what would it be? Well, this is, this is going probably deeper than maybe you were thinking. No, um, I want it. I want it. But six months ago was just about Memorial day, you know, five, six months ago. And we all remember what happened after that with George Floyd and, uh, and, and the conversation that had already started, but really got elevated quickly after we all saw that horrific video of, you know, the policeman kneeling into George Floyd's neck. And of course he doesn't survive. And it opened up, a, I say a can of worms as the cliche, but it opened up quite the dialogue and it really impacted a lot of people. And for me at first, I just was, you know, I'm a white middle-aged dude. I I'm confused. I'm, I'm sad. Uh, but I, I didn't try to speak up and say, I knew it all. Cause I certainly don't. 
And I'm not a black man or a black person who has gone through oppression like many black people have. And so I, I think the one thing that I can take away is I, I sat and I listened early on to my friends who were black and even some of my friends who, were, who weren't black and just kind of wanted to learn and see the reactions. And, you know, I, there's a great song by a band called Sidewalk Prophets called um, Come to the Table. And it talks about all of us having a seat at the table to talk, you know, and to listen and to learn without judgment, without jumping on social media and ripping people apart, yeah. without having any political ideologies or any, any biases, just sitting at the table and talking and listening more than talking. And what that moment with George Floyd in that time allowed me to do and what I've learned, Andy, and what it's shown me was... We need to continue to have conversations and listen to people we don't understand, maybe even people we disagree with, people that look different than us, people that think different than us. And I'm thankful that I have some friends in my life um, who are like that and right. who challenge me. And we've continued the discussion even as recently as last week and to continue to have breakfast or go just to hang out or talk and keep the conversation going and not just have it be a you know, an internet viral thing that happens for a month or two, and then we just move on to the next internet viral thing. But to have a real conversation, you know, my friend Emmanuel Acho wrote a book called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. And I read it recently and I thought, okay, I'm uncomfortable, you know, and this book isn't exactly something that I, I, I completely understand. Uh, in some cases, I don't agree with everything in it, but I wanted to read it, A, because he's my friend, but B, because he spent all this time trying to write this book. Let me understand where he's coming from here. And uh, that's what I've tried to do, Andy. I think over the past six months, that's the big lesson for me. Uh, and I don't know if that would have happened if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic, to be quite honest. Right. Because we've all had to stop and focus and pause. But I think going through a pandemic and then seeing that happen forced me to really think and to pray and to react and, and, and not react in a bad way, but react in a good way by listening and not ignoring the fact that there are some people hurting here. And uh, yeah, it was a pretty powerful time for me. Well, that's why we, <clears throat> that's why we call this the peace table right here. And yes. uh, we are, you know, I mean, I'm, I, 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 I'm with you, man. We get the conversations got to continue. We got to have conversations. I, I often say I would like to, you know, I, I, I got it in for whoever that first architect was who designed a house without a front porch that oh. made everybody started retreating to their backyards and then privacy fences. And you only talk to the people that are like you, you know, so, so true. there is so much to be said for sitting on that front porch and, you know, generating that conversation with everybody who walks by because we are all in different places and know different things <clears throat> and if truth is one thing we are all trying to get to the to the best so the truth is like the best they're both one thing you know so we want so, the best thank you buddy for being here yeah. we appreciate you so much and uh, the book is the uniform of leadership uh jason romano we will have everything about where to contact you uh, how to get on your Facebook page, how to show up at your house for Halloween. We'll, we're going to have everything on the show notes for you. I love it. Listen, this is an honor, Andy. Thank you for inviting me on your show. I'm always a fan of yours. I'm grateful for the times you've come on our show, uh, the one I, I produce with Sports Spectrum, and it's quite an honor to be back on yours. So thanks for having me. Thank you, buddy. Thank you for being here. I'm Andy Andrews, the professional noticer, harnessing common sense and wisdom to plow through challenges all the way to an answer for you. And I think that'll do it for this week. Get us out of here, Matthew. So, ladies and gentlemen, and to the boys and girls who aspire to become ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the end of another episode of The Professional Noticer. In a world where common sense has become a superpower, I'm harnessing what mental energy I have for you. Seeking wisdom, making observations, and endeavoring to answer tough questions in a way that will empower your family and your business. I'm Andy Andrews. Until next week, smile while you talk, even behind that mask. Don't breathe anyone else's air yet, but make sure you have a positive answer to the question, how's it going? 
And so, until next week, goodbye. This episode of The Professional Noticer was produced by Matt Limpert. The Noticer theme written and performed by Sugarcane Jane. Sardines in olive oil provided by Twinkle and Smoke of Beverly Hills. Additional financial consideration provided by FreedomEagleUniversity.edu. Are you tired of that dead-end job? Do you want to sail to the top of any field or the industry of your choosing? With an online degree from FreedomEagleUniversity.edu, your untapped potential can be realized. Soon, you'll be soaring to that successful future you have always envisioned. FreedomEagleUniversity.edu has rewritten the rulebook when it comes to creating a curriculum that yields incredible results with courses like Being Great at Business, Talking Good, Public Scandal Damage Control, and our special course for your employees, Active Complacency. Despite what you may have read on the internet, FreedomEagleUniversity.edu is an accredited university with regular accreditation audits done by the Freedom Eagle Board of Cosmetology and Chainsaw Repair. A degree from us is as good as the paper it is printed on. That is our guarantee. We are Freedom Eagle University.edu.